The United States Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, regulates a wide variety of products beyond just food and drugs, including biologics, tobacco, veterinary products, medical devices, and even cosmetics. Their broad jurisdiction represents about 20 cents of every dollar in our economy, so it can have a big impact on our lives. I recently sat down with the head of the FDA, Commissioner Dr. Robert Califf. We discussed the threat of misinformation and what needs to be done to restore our trust in science. I asked him about drug shortages and whether the situation is getting better or worse. We also reviewed what the FDA is thinking as it relates to potential regulation of marijuana and cannabis. With all the recent news around medications for weight loss, I pointedly asked him about factors that play a role in obesity. Is it mostly biologic or lifestyle? He also shares his opinions on whether AI will soon be used in the drug review process. It was a far-reaching interview, and I'm happy to share it with you. Well, Dr. Caleb, thanks for joining me. Great to be here. Now, you've been quoted as saying misinformation is a leading cause of death. You revised it a bit to say it's a leading cause of preventable death. What do you mean by that? What I really mean by that is that if you look at why people are dying today um, at an earlier age than just sort of aging as a phenomenon, uh, it's been COVID where we have vaccines that work and antivirals that work and they're free. Um, chronic diseases are on the rise, stroke, heart attack on the rise now, drug overdose, um, consequences of depression, gun violence. Mm -hmm. Those are the big things. They're all related to people's processing of information, what they come to believe based on the ecosystem of information that they exist in. And um, while you could say, well, you know, if it's stroke, it's that you have a blood clot or, or some other mm -hmm. phenomenon. You could also say blood pressure wasn't controlled. We have a bunch mm -hmm. of generic, generic drugs that work. Why aren't people getting the right information? So what's the fix to it? That's a great question. I, you know, and the real advantage of being an FDA commissioner, is, as you know, is that um, people usually return my calls. Okay. I've talked to all the experts I can find. I think we're learning more and more about misinformation mm -hmm. and how it works and um, how uh, bad information is transmitted, mm -hmm. how much more quickly it moves around the Internet. Mm -hmm. But uh, the formula for changing it, for fixing it, I haven't found anyone yet who believes they have the right answer. Now, we have a number of things that everyone agrees should be done. We need to restore faith in our key institutions mm -hmm. where, on average, there'll be more reliable, truthful mm -hmm. information. That's a really important thing that needs to be done. We need to anticipate when misinformation might be coming, something very important mm -hmm. to FDA, or pre it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if misinformation is promulgated, we need to react quickly. Well, when it comes to misinformation, trust, as you alluded, plays a key role. And you talked about restoring trust. We know there's been decreased in trust of government over the last few years. But let's kind of play out the scenario that the public often hears. They hear about a drug that's been approved by the FDA under an expedited pathway or breakthrough designation. And that gives the impression that the public needs this therapy now. Then it goes to CMS, a sister agency, same department, often looks at the same data, and then says, oh wait, we're not gonna pay for this. Yet we just said it's so important, it has to be an expedited pathway. Or they say, we're only gonna do it as part of a clinical trial for which there were just clinical trials done, or say we're gonna have a more limited population. So what does that say to the public when they're saying, who, who do they trust? Well, John, a, a couple of things about that. First of all, they don't often do that. In fact, it's been quite rare. There are only a couple of Recently, examples. though, it's happened a few times, as you know, in some high-profile Just a couple ones. of times. Mm -hmm. And I will say that often the press seizes on, there might be a hundred things where there's no issue, and then mm -hmm. there are two where there is an issue. What gets all the attention? The two where there is an issue. And so we have to deal with it. Because there's an that. issue, and people yeah. are concerned about it. Well, um, it's really important to point out, the FDA you know, has a statutory obligation to look at safety and effectiveness um, for an intended use. 
uh, Congress passed laws creating these accelerated pathways because the public spoke and Congress mm -hmm. said uh, Americans on average are willing to take more risk because you know, it's reasonably likely is the criteria for an accelerated approval. Not Often for diseases for which we don't already have good therapies. Yeah, so there is a, a burden point. of disease and need. But can you see the perspective of the public that then when they hear, oh, wait, they're excited that FDA has approved something, maybe for a rare disease, maybe for a disease with unmet need, and then it's not going to be paid for. And realistically, because these are new drugs, there is a big cost. People can't afford that. So even if it's only a few cases over years, those are still important cases for people. And that, that decreases trust because they can't understand how can well, the government, and that we know it's not one entity, come to different conclusions often well, the on way, the same data. You know, the way I've looked at it, I mean, again, remember, we need to do a better job of explaining it because CMS has different criteria than FDA. CMS's criteria... Medically necessary and reasonable. Yeah. But the public doesn't understand those distinctions. Well, so we have to keep talking about it, and people like you will need to help us do that. But for the reasons that I just gave, we have limited um, venues of expression. But the other part of it is... Um, you might ask the question, why historically in America have we not had a tight connection between FDA and CMS? And we could have a long okay, discussion why about have why we... that might be the case. <laughs> are, 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 we, and, are you fixing that? Well, fixing it would be an overstatement. But the way I look at it, it's like a relay race. We run a lap. We don't want to drop the baton in the dark and have CMS try to pick it up and run because the, they are using a different set of criteria to make their decisions. But we need to hand off that baton much more smoothly and work with companies as they develop their products to develop more of the information that CMS needs to make the decision that they need to make. What and information do they need that's different than looking at if a drug's improving outcomes for people? Well, remember that accelerated issue? approvals are not based on outcomes. They're based on biomarkers mm -hmm. for the most part. There might be an intermediate outcome, a not surrogate. the final outcome. Mm -hmm. And by requirement in those approvals, there has to be a follow-on trial to prove it. So um, CMS increasingly is going to need to look at, like, what's the magnitude of benefit? How does it compare to other options that people have? And I think at the end of phase three, there's a lot that we can do as okay. we move into the era of pragmatic clinical trials using electronic health mm -hmm. records, for example, to look at large populations. I mean, remembering that FDA is typically looking in an accelerated approval at a small patient population, carefully selected, not at the broader population that might be treated. Let's say, with, you know, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's is the sure. case that has been the most talked about. That's a lot of people. And ever since, you know, you're an intern on the Duke Coronary mm -hmm. Care Unit, we would develop a treatment, but it was often in post-market we would clarify exactly who gets the benefit. Okay. What are the... Po subpopulations who are at risk. And that's the kind of information that would really help CMS and the mm -hmm. commercial payers who also mm -hmm. have to pay for it. I mean, after all, we're spending $4.3 trillion yeah. a year on health care, mm -hmm. and we have worse outcomes than any other high-income yeah. country. So something's we're paying for okay. something that's not working here. I want to turn to food safety. I ran into you in Boston. Uh, when you were speaking at a conference and said, you know, I want to talk about what we're doing in terms of, of food safety. And there have been uh, issues, as you know, in terms of food recalls. Just a, a point of statistic is a 700% increase in recalls in 2022 compared to 2021. We all know about the infant formula shortage. And most people don't know, despite the fact that food is in the moniker of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration that it has a role in the safety of our food supply. So I wanted to ask you, what is FDA doing to make sure that our food supply is safe? And how is that different than the Department of Agriculture? Sure. Um, there's sort of a division um, where the FDA is actually responsible for about 80 percent of the food supply in terms of safety. Um, Tom Bilsack, who's the Secretary of Agriculture, told me a simple way to remember it is uh, barnyard animals. The Agriculture Department has responsibility for barnyard animals and, interestingly, okay. catfish. So we're responsible mm -hmm. for all the other fish, but 
One thing to, just to clarify, um, the economists did a, a global ranking of food safety, and U.S. was tied for first with Denmark and Canada. So we got a lot of work yeah. improvements we can make, and certainly when I was uh, went through the nomination process this time, I got a lot of calls saying you've got to pay yeah. attention to food. It's been underserved. The number of people on the food side of the FDA is the same as it was 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, remember that the medical product side has been boosted by... Um, user, user fees, fees from the industry, those don't exist on the food side. Mm -hmm. And so it's been really under um, nourished, I guess yeah. you'd say, uh, sort of as a pun. Um, so we do inspections, we do a lot of analyses, we work with the CDC. You're doing some restructuring though, aren't you? And, and making some changes in terms of how That's the processes right. work. Um, because of the fact that there were not user fees, and it was, it's an, the food industry is enormous with all these different parts and components, the food side of the FDA had sort of just grown organically into yeah. a lot of different components. So we're going to put it all together under a single program, the Human Food System. We're going to bring together the inspectorate and the subject matter experts in food into a much tighter information-driven organization. Altogether, there's something like 600,000 entities that we're responsible for. But as, as you know, having been at FDA, I'm sure you also know that the states um, have a lot of responsibility here too. And we work closely with the states, for like retail um, entities, the states do all those inspections, but we set the standards and um, have many contracts and relationships with the states. I want to talk about cannabis. And you've stated that CBD products need a different regulatory pathway. They're not a food. They're not a drug. And I want to take a step back. And if you could help educate folks, what's the difference between marijuana, cannabis, CBD products, and what exactly is the FDA going to regulate? I think it's... So... Uh, it, it's complicated. There are um, over 20 derivatives of the cannabis plant that are different chemicals mm -hmm. that do different things. And Congress stepped in and by law mandated that if the concentration of the active component of marijuana that we all think about mm -hmm. is below a certain level, then it's called hemp. Yep. And that's not regulated by FDA. And it's available in a lot of different mm -hmm. forms. CBD is a different form and it's being sold, but there's no legal um, uh, regulation of CBD at this point. A lot of people thought we should regulate it as either a sup dietary supplement mm -hmm. or a food. Um, we spent a couple of years looking carefully at this, and there are safety issues that make it so um, it really doesn't fit into either of those categories. So we think that CBD should be regulated through a new pathway. Uh, we're currently working with the executive branch and okay. Congress to define that. It's up to Congress to write a law, as you mm -hmm. know, for us to be able to regulate it. So it, it's going to be, you know, I can't say what we're going to do. But as it stands now, it's not regulated. That's correct? right. Okay. And then recreational marijuana is a whole different issue because mm -hmm. you have a number of states uh, that have, and medical marijuana, when it there is one drug, which, um, you know, uh, it is a derivative of marijuana that's been through the whole process of drug development. But for the most part, people are using marijuana for medical purposes, buying it at the okay. store since it's legal in many states. And that's a whole other mm -hmm. issue. And then we have new components of mar marijuana now being marketed, some that are highly, um, uh, have, have big effects and uh, have significant dangers that are going to need to be regulated. Let's turn to drug shortages, and we've seen them in typically antimicrobials, sometimes chemotherapeutic agents, and we've heard from a lot of viewers who've got caught up in terms of the shortages, uh, in terms of what the quotas are from DEA. So I wanted to ask you, what can you assure patients today who are prescribed a prescription for ADHD, their ability to get that prescription fulfilled? Well. All right, so let's, let's back up a little bit, because when we talk about drug shortages, what's in the news now has more to do with generic drugs mm -hmm. even than sure. Adderall. And, um, you know, if, if we think about the pharmaceutical industry, people tend to think of it as one industry, but really we have an innovator industry which develops new drugs, and they have a patent life. Um, 
there's a lot of talk about the profits that are made in doing mm -hmm. that and the risk involved in development. And then you have the generic industry, which is 90% of prescriptions today, where it's all based on the lowest price. And this has caused a big problem that um, where a number of generic drugs mm -hmm. are in shortage at any given time because there's not enough profit yeah. for a company to say, we want to go into the business of making that drug. So Adderall is a very special case because it's... Um, a controlled substance whose quota is controlled or regulated by the DEA. By the DEA That's right. Different agency. And um, in addition to that, we have two other factors that have come into play. Um, there's been a tremendous increase in um, prescribing, some of it related to um, virtual prescribing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's caused a number of problems. Some firms apparently have put prescribers on bonuses for prescribing more. And so there's been this big growth in um, prescriptions. When, so if you have yeah. a DA setting a quota and then sure. prescriptions go up, it's understandable um, that you have a shortage. But I think there's also a professional responsibility here. Now, if you can tell me among people who may have um, some degree of attention deficit disorder, who needs a prescription and who doesn't, I would love to hear what the answer to that is. We really need much better evidence and professional standards here. Some people will argue, and, and they've said it on Medscape as well, that the clinical community doesn't take conditions like ADHD in adults as seriously as they do for children. And in some ways that creates an inaction. So you're right, so we've had some bad apples who have over-prescribed, but there is a, you know, the majority of the patients who have a legitimate prescription, a legitimate diagnosis, are getting frustrated that they don't have access to a medication, and then they're suffering from executive dysfunction in a way <laughs> that then they have to yeah. do all these and things to try to get it, which complicates uh, their lives. So that's what we've heard from a lot of people saying, well, what is the FDA doing about that? What can they do about it? Recognizing so they don't have all the authority to do everything. You, you just say it's very frustrating and um, painful for us. And, you know, right now there's a shortage of fundamental cancer drugs. Yes. And um, I, we wish that we could fix all these things, but we, we don't make the medicines and we can't um, tell someone they must make medicines. And so there's some things that are out of our control. But what we do is work with all the companies involved. Mm -hmm. Very often a shortage occurs because one company has a quality problem with sure. their manufacturing, mm -hmm. and then we have to Often try to abroad, get other companies with to, issues. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we work on all those things as much as we can. I just also say that um, if only the people that needed um, these drugs got them, there probably wouldn't be a shortage. There's a there's a large amount of use which is on the margins, and uh, this is why I say we need better mm -hmm. clinical uh, standards. But having said all that, we're working with the DEA okay. frequently um, as they try to work out what the quotas are. Mm -hmm. And we're working with the companies to optimize production. So that shortage should go away. It, it's better now than it was a few months ago, and it's going to continue to get better. Let's talk about what everyone's talking about, artificial intelligence, digital tools, chat GPT. Um, so, Dr. Jeff Shoren, who runs the Center uh, for Devices and Radiologic Health, recently said at an FDLI, Food Drug Law Institute meeting, as it relates to these tools, uh, he said, be afraid, be very afraid. <laughs> what should the public be afraid about in terms well, of these tools, and do you share that perspective? Well, first of all, as you know, and just to disclose to those who may be listening, between my two FDA stints, I spent part of my time yes. working at Alphabet, the parent That's why I know you know Google. about this. <laughs> That's I'm interested in your perspective. Thinking mm -hmm. about this. And um, so I would say this is like a lot of the great innovations mm -hmm. for humankind. It can be used for tremendous good or it mm -hmm. could be used for tremendous harm. And so I think Jeff's statement about be afraid is, we'd better be paying attention to the potential for harm, trying to do what we can to move the technology in the direction yeah. that it does good. And probably- well, that's the, a negative perspective. You could have the other perspective as well that here we have this opportunity. Oh to yeah. Innovate. It's a, yeah. And it's a, we have to have guardrails, but we don't have to be fearful per se. Well, um, 
I think it's always good to have in the back of your mind that harm can be done. Otherwise, I mean, you know, I've lived my whole career, as you know, working with people yeah. developing new treatments. And if you're excited about the treatment, you may not see the downside. And so part of, you know, it's just in my nature mm -hmm. to think about the potential downside. But I'm very excited about the upside. After, you know, 35 years as a clinician, mm -hmm. the idea that maybe I wouldn't have to copy and paste yeah. all my notes that, you know, I could edit mm -hmm. um, a, a large language model derived note. And, and I saw in my work uh, on the Googles and, and Verily um, components that uh, cultivating the um, pruning of information to correct inaccuracies in the record, that's the kind of thing that artificial intelligence can do very well. So it should make our lives easier. But it also um, can reach into knowledge bases that are just very hard for us to reach into in our cognitive yeah. thinking. The difference between thinking on a search to find what you need and saying, you know, go find what you can about problem X that might be relevant to this patient, that's, a, that's going to be a big difference and it's going to get better and better. So I'm very excited about mm -hmm. that. Now, drug company sponsors often are using AI to look for potential new compounds, new indications for compounds. Do you foresee, say, in the next few years, that AI will be used as part of the drug review process? I, yeah, the short answer is yes. Uh, I mean, AI is... What's the long answer? <laughs> I mean, AI is in more of what we do every day than mm -hmm. people realize. And, you know, that I could see um, in my previous job. I mean, if you are driving from point A to point B, you're mm -hmm. using algorithms that are um, anticipating what your mm -hmm. preferences are and also keeping track of incoming information about traffic all at the same time. In the very same way with biology, it is being used increasingly. And I had a chance to see AlphaFold as it um, developed. And mm -hmm. you know, this is really making a difference in drug okay. discovery. But there's also clinical trials. How do you um, optimize the conduct sure. of clinical trials? And in the reviews, um, the amount, you've been there, the amount mm -hmm. of um, rote um, pulling forward yeah. of old material, that's going to be much easier. In the old days, it was truckloads yeah. of paper. And so now the reviewer Literally. could really yeah. edit things in, uh, in the future and not have to go back so and So you wouldn't redo. be surprised if we see AI tools as part of drug review? Not at all. Okay. Wouldn't be at all surprised. Yeah. As many people know, you're a cardiologist. You spent much of your professional career at Duke. We were just talking about it. That's the place for the Duke Center for Living one of the first places that focused on behavioral interventions. They even have a section on the website called Behavioral Cardiology. So I have to ask you, Dr. Califf, is obesity primarily a biologic <laughs> disease? I am very excited about this. And again, um, in, in uh, full disclosure, as an academic, back in mm -hmm. my old academic life, when the GLP-1 agonist first came along. Mm -hmm. um, I got involved with Professor Rory Holman at Oxford and we were co-PIs on what on really the first big yeah. cardiovascular outcome trial with the GLP-1. And you could see... Used for diabetes, yeah. not for obesity. Mm -hmm. But you could see the weight loss and mm -hmm. um, we just, at first we thought, well gee, this is just like nausea causing. Yeah. But turns out, I think, that you know, the integration of the circuits between the gut and the brain is an amazing thing. And so you could say it is, it's an interaction of biology and behavior at the same time, but much more biologically driven than we thought is what I would say, because But every some people trial, are out there saying it's mostly biologic. I, I don't know how to really interpret that because um, our biology hasn't changed that much from generation to generation, mm -hmm. but we're more obese now than we mm -hmm. were. So that's gotta be some behavioral you know, when rural people are exercising less than urban yeah. people, I don't know how you can say it's just mm -hmm. biologic. But what we do know is that you can uh, make it better through okay. manipulation of these circuits. And as, as every, it seems like every trial that's coming mm -hmm. in is looking better and better. Okay. I always have to say, we yeah. need the big trial data mm -hmm. for people with obesity without diabetes. And those trials are underway and will soon be coming. Will there be phase four post-market surveillance? The, the field of obesity-related drugs is littered with some bad outcomes when you're looking five, ten years later. 
the yeah. impact on the heart, the impact on some of the organs. W will there be more requirements for you know post market that, studies? There'll be a lot of post market because it's going. This is such a big issue for society, mm -hmm. and of course we can do the post market data a lot better than we could before now with electronic records, et cetera. What about the issue of, do you expect there to be more enforcement actions against those companies that perhaps are promoting weight loss therapies that aren't indicated for it or, or going beyond full discussion of risks and benefits? You know, in the past, the number of warning letters or enforcement actions uh, has decreased. Do you expect there perhaps to be a difference as we're starting to see greater attention in um, terms of obesity? I mean, you bring up a really interesting area that we are all going to need to do more work on. As you know, we regulate the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. companies. We don't regulate doctors. We don't regulate the practice of medicine. And this, this is actually related to the Adderall issue that we were describing. Mm -hmm. If you're a doctor and you're advertising that you're prescribing Adderall and how great it is, or a weight loss drug, that's a very ambiguous area for FDA mm -hmm. to get into, and yet we know that there are examples of harm being done in that regard. We also have similar issues with stem cell uh, therapy. So this is a this is a complex yeah. and difficult area, and I can't say I'm happy with where we are right now. But what's the remedy? Um, I wish I knew exactly what the remedy is. One part of the remedy has to be better behavior by the medical profession. You're a professor. You've graded a lot of students and residents <laughs> over the years. What grade would you give the FDA since you've become commissioner? Um, I learned in my very first hearing not to give grades <laughs> about the place that I work. So I won't give a grade. What I'd say is we are coming out of the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, it was an amazingly stressful time where you had all the issues that were compounded in the FDA from just routine mm -hmm. business, plus the pandemic. And as we've been lifting the hood, we are making a lot of changes in the FDA all at one time. So it's a bit stressful. But what I would also say, show me anyone who argues that the U.S. is not number one in innovation in medical products, drugs, devices, biologics. The Economist ranked us as number mm -hmm. one in food, tied with Canada and Denmark mm -hmm. in food safety. We're in a bad place in terms of infant mortality. We're in a bad place in terms of life expectancy. We still see increases in cardiovascular death. So those I, are all good things, but we also have well, a lot of these other challenges. When I'm wearing my FDA hat, I say, <laughs> we're doing our part. Now, where we're failing mm -hmm. as a country is in the implementation. So we're inventing the drugs, devices, and biologics that the world is using maybe using more effectively and more in the right people than we are. We also have to face the fact that a lot of our um, issues with premature mm -hmm. mortality, as I say, are misinformation related. Maybe there's, may, maybe there's something the FDA can do about that, okay. but we need everyone on board. Mm -hmm. The whole ecosystem needs yeah. to get more active. But I, I, I do want to resonate uh, with what you said, that we have right now a five-year shorter life expectancy mm -hmm. than the average of yeah. other high-income countries, and we're in the negative direction. This is not getting better. I, I want to end with just, you referenced the pandemic, and we all can agree that at some point in time, there's going to be another pandemic. Everyone wants to know, what would the FDA do differently for the next well, pandemic? Of course, I wasn't here uh, mm -hmm. when COVID started. I was watching it from mm -hmm. San Francisco, um, and like many people involved in trying to help, I, I feel like the FDA did a great job in its role in the pandemic. The one area where I think, uh, so, you know, the, the, the vaccines are uh, amazing. Who would have thought sure. vaccines could be Absolutely. developed? And FDA had a big role in that. The mm -hmm. antivirals, it made a huge Mm -hmm. uh, difference. Uh, food is an area, I, don't, I shouldn't say FDA, all of government. You remember in the early days of the pandemic when the grocery stores yeah. didn't have anything on the shelves? The food supply, um, just a lot of people put work into mm -hmm. keeping that going and uh, dealing with a lot of shortages that were underway and working with yeah. companies to make that work out. In the diagnostic arena, we ended up with a bunch of tests. Mm -hmm. It didn't start out so smoothly. No. Mm -hmm. And I think I think we, um, 
between FDA, CDC, and NIH now. A course correction and... And so now we're ready to go. And we know um, MPOX came more quickly, mm -hmm. still a few hiccups. So I feel like we've got the playbook. I'm very concerned Congress is not allocating money mm -hmm. to be ready for the next pandemic. I mean, it's something we should mm -hmm. all be worried about. What are you most excited about your role here this time around? Oh, it's just, it's, it's just amazing to see the progress in science and medicine. Um, but I'm most excited about the chance to change public health. So your statement about the fact that public health is not necessarily going the right direction now, I, I mean, you know me, I, I like problems. I don't, mm -hmm. If something's working well, I don't want to work with it. Uh, I want to take on problems. we got big problems with our public health now. And like I say, the FDA is only one player, mm -hmm. but we live in a HHS ecosystem that includes uh, CDC and NIH mm -hmm. and uh, CMS. There's a lot that we can do. And I also love working with the private sector. I mean, American ingenuity is really important. We got to make it work better. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's an exciting time, but a, a lot of work to do. Dr. Caleb, thank you. For it's doing a pleasure. That. Thank Good you. To see you.